Good uh, afternoon. Welcome to another edition of McMaster Perspective to treat or not to treat COVID series. I would like to introduce Professor uh, Edward Mills, um, who probably knows more than anybody else I know about a new concept of uh, testing efficacies of treatment in COVID pandemics. Uh, Professor Mills, maybe we can start by asking you to introduce yourself. Thank you, Roman. I'd be delighted to. I'm a graduate of McMaster from about 15 or 16 years ago. I'm an uh, associate professor in the Department of uh, Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact. And uh, the majority of the time, I work for a company called Cytel, where I design clinical trials, predominantly for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The majority of my trials tend to happen in low-income settings, um, but because of the nature of this pandemic, I've been pulled into trials here in North America, Europe, and uh, around the world. Okay, well, you know, I, as a methodologist for a number of years, I keep learning, and now I would like to learn about two concepts which I keep hearing about. One of them is called platform uh, trials, and another is adaptive trial results, and they both keep cropping up and popping up in the setting of COVID pandemics. Could you take us through it? Sure, I'd be delighted to. So the funny thing is that for the last probably five years, I've been uh, working on adaptive trials and I've been singing the praises of them and getting very little attention um, about this topic. It is only uh, since this pandemic came along that people recognize there's a need to move as swiftly as possible. And for that reason, um, adaptive tr trials have in fact become almost the new norm uh, for, uh, for evaluating interventions in the COVID scenario. So I have some slides uh, to share. The first slide is, uh, demonstrates the general outline of a platform trial. A platform trial is uh, usually um, designed with multiple arms and then they follow patients and they do various looks at the data, pre-planned looks at the data. And depending on what kind of uh, message the data is sending you in the interim evaluations, you may decide to drop an arm, or in fact, you might decide to change an arm and add an arm. You could begin a trial with just two interventions, for example, then do an evaluation, add another arm. If, if, it, if the uh, findings were inconclusive, or perhaps you've been convinced at that stage to drop an arm. And the majority of um, the big trials, the multi-center and multi-country trials occurring within COVID are platform trials at the moment. So if I could ask you a question uh, on, on a maybe simpler language, platform trial, essentially you are taking potentially different intervention, drug or intervention A, B, and C, and you could randomize people to intervention A or no intervention A, to intervention B or no intervention B, intervention C or no intervention C, correct? That's correct. And they can share the so, they can share a control arm or they can share the comparison between arms. Right. So you may end up being subjected to all three interventions or combination of two or single or rarely none of them, correct? Uh, not really. Um, so in a classic platform design, you would randomize people into one of several arms, let's say three arms and then uh, follow them for a period. At the end of that period of time, you look at the data. If you decide that the data tells you to drop an arm because it, it's futile or it's harmful or, or in fact, it's convincingly good, um, you can drop an arm at that stage and add an arm. You may want to re-randomize the patient within a trial, uh, but we don't generally see that. Okay. Well, keep going. I interrupted you. My pleasure. So. Um, Traditional RCTs usually have two arms and a set period of time that we're going to follow, follow a patient. With adaptive designs, uh, we're allowing the data to inform us about um, what's occurring within a trial, uh, to, to um, inform us whether or not there's convincing evidence emerging from the trial of either futility, harm, or tre treatment effects. Um, and so for that reason, we're trying to evaluate multiple interventions at the very same time. And this is an effort to speed along decision-making. 
the remap cap trial is one of the highest profile trials occurring within the COVID epidemic. It's a multi-arm trial uh, that was already going on for community acquired pneumonia uh, prior to the pandemic, but very cleverly, they had a pandemic arm pre-planned for the last several years. And at the beginning of March, they realized that they needed to activate this arm. And uh, so the remap tra cap trial was a platform trial that was already going on and uh, is, has now enrolled patients in more than 50 different settings around the world. There are in fact uh, six different master protocol and platform trials going on at the moment. A master protocol is the overarching name for different designs of multi-arm evaluations. It's perhaps not the best name for, for, um, for a trial design because it can mean so many different things to different people. You can have a, uh, a platform trial that we just discussed. You could have a basket trial. A basket trial is um, where you're looking at uh, different populations, uh, sorry, different interventions for a similar population and following them over time. Or you could have an umbrella trial, which is you're looking at related populations. Let's say we're looking at uh, COVID patients. We might look at mild uh, disease patients and treat them in one way. We might look at more severe patients and hospitalized patients and be treating them with either the same interventions or combinations with interventions, all occurring within one trial. And a clinician would probably say, look, these are different populations, and indeed they are, but they can occur within, within one trial because a patient can graduate from one aspect of it into the next. One of the highest profile trials that's going on at the moment is the Solidarity Trial that WHO has uh, been hosting. And the Solidarity Trial was designed by WHO and has an overarching data safety monitoring committee at WHO run by academics around the world. Um, and the reason that that was put in place was because it became obvious early on that there was a um, heterogeneous number of uh, trials going on and heterogeneous uh, quality of clinical trials going on. So um, there was a recognition, having learned from the Ebola epidemic, that we can't have dozens and dozens of trials going on that are not linked. Uh, we need to be able to learn from the different sites. So now there are 17 different countries participating in solidarity as of today. And so it's interventions, uh, four different interventions, um, I'm sorry, five different interventions uh, among hospitalized patients. It's a unique trial because it is this multi-country because there doesn't appear to be any shortage of patients for this trial. And so some methodological interesting elements are that there is no sample size calculation to determine whether or not you've got enough patients. They have no pre-specified stopping rules and no predetermined uh, interim uh, evaluations. Um, we will see how this goes. It's never been done before. Uh, and I think a lot of people are watching to see how, how it goes. Canada has their own uh, office for the solidarity trial. And uh, I believe there's several um, ICUs participating in this. I, I do not see your, uh, your slide at the moment. Uh, could you remind us what is being tested? Because what is being tested is also indication of where is the equipose, at least according to some people. So the different arms in the solidarity trial are remdesivir uh, plus uh, supportive care in one arm, hydroxychloroquine, plus supportive care in another arm, uh, Kalitra or Lipinavir, in, plus uh, supportive care, uh, Kalitra plus interferon, um, and then the control arm is optimized supportive care. There is some reason to believe that uh, oh. emerging evidence, uh, you know, is reducing our enthusiasm for some of these interventions at the moment. Professor Mills, thank you very much for correcting my misconception about uh... Uh, about platform trials. Uh, that's very useful for me already. Uh, maybe we'll go now to how those designs are at the moment employed in, in around the world in, in the face of COVID pandemic. Thank you, Roman. So I would like to bring the audience attention to a tool that they might find useful. Uh, it's a clinical trial tracker that we built uh, with the support of FAST grants and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You can find it at www.covid-trials.com or .org, either will work. And what we've done there is that 
on a day-to-day -day basis, we search all of the clinical trial registries around the world to find out what trials are registered, what trials are recruiting, what trials might have finished. And we've plotted them uh, according to geography as well as according to methodological aspects. And if you visit the site, you'll be able to um, follow uh, what's of interest to you. Um, but I think you'll find it interesting that a large amount of the trials uh, began early March. We now have uh, over 590 randomized trials that have been registered in simply a month. This is uh, unprecedented in, in medical history. Um, and we'll see how many of them end up reading out. Uh, what we are finding is that a lot of the trials that were registered and even enrolled in China, for example, um, within a short period of time, the number of cases in China has gone down dramatically. And as a result of that, uh, many of those trials are probably unlikely to, to finish. However, if you look at this 590 trials, I think it tells an interesting story. Uh, the ma majority of these trials, about 50% of them, only investigate one intervention versus a control. And the majority of them are small trials, a sample size of less than 100 participants. So again, this, this uh, indicates that we need to have larger trials uh, that inter evaluate more interventions uh, than, than um, just two arms will, will allow. Uh, certain treatments are being particularly over-investigated and repeated again and again and again. For example, uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine features as a treatment in 118 separate trials, even though uh, there's 590 trials. Uh, you know, a large majority of them are hydroxychloroquine, and uh, it may well turn out very soon that there's convincing evidence that hydroxychloroquine um, may, may not be effective. I think also if you look at the geographic sp spread of the trials, it tells us that um, the majority of trials were initiated in East, East Asia, uh, 334 of them in China, um, virtually none in Africa. Uh, the settings that have the weakest health system, South Asia and Africa, 11 trials registered for Africa, uh, seven for South Asia, only 12 for South America. And yet these are the settings that have the weakest health system. So as COVID does take hold in those environments, we're going to immediately need uh, clinical trials. And uh, I'm part of several trials that we are hoping to get funded in those settings. Uh, but, we're, you know, we're going to have to wait and see if that, if that occurs. I also think it's useful for you to look at what the network of interventions looks like. And we can see that um, among the hospitalized, uh, patients, amongst outpatients, uh, among prophylaxis populations and healthcare workers. Again, there's an overrepresentation of the few different interventions, hydroxychloroquine, azithro, uh, azithromycin, um, uh, lopinavir, and um, remdesivir. And so what we really need is more interventions should those fail. We need to have backup interventions uh, to consider. And uh, there is a pipeline of biotech interventions coming. So I think the initial thoughts on how to respond to a pandemic were about, can we repurpose drugs right away while we wait for biotechs to develop new interventions? And so that's what's happening. Uh, we're quickly running out of options on those repurposing though. So we need to get new molecules into clinical trials. In conclusion, I would say this represents uh, in some ways a disconnected uh, research effort. In other ways, this is an historic event in terms of unprecedented collaboration, unprecedented efforts to get into clinical trials as quickly as possible. And unsurprisingly, as time goes on, we're going to get, get better organized about how to do the trials. Um, and I think in conclusion, I really pray, just like everybody else does, that the COVID epidemic goes away. Um, but we will also have learned so much from this epidemic that I hope we can bring into how we do future clinical trials. And we could be at an era where the new norm is far more efficient. Well, a, a great review of the story. I, it sounds like a heaven for people who will be doing meta-analysis down the road. And I pray with you that at least one of those, um, one of those drugs um, will become uh, very, very effective. Uh, Professor Mills, it's a real pleasure to, to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Roman.